Hi, everybody. Good morning. So let me just briefly introduce Roberta. So first of all, it's really a pleasure to have Roberta Gatti here. And I think she is really the, the perfect speaker for a size seminar, both because she can, at the same time, she can show what academic rigor and policy relevance. And this is what she did through, throughout her career. And this is also the reason why uh, she taught four years at SAIS in DC. So Roberta is having, a, had a, is having a very remarkable career at the World Bank, where she joined out of Harvard, where she did her PhD in the Young Economist Program. And she had a number of positions at the bank. And uh, um, both at the research department at the beginning, where she wrote some very important paper, the one with uh, with Bismond, decentralization and corruption is, is a classic for many of us. And she worked on very different subjects from growth to productivity, gender, social inclusion, and labor market. And then while well, she's taking out more and more responsibility, she's starting managing large research programs. And she was the chief economist for the World Bank Human Development Group, where uh, she uh, sort of invented the human development, the World Bank Human Development Index, you may be, some of you may be aware of. And now she decides, then she moved to the Middle East and North Africa region, where she is the chief economist. Exactly, it is in these positions that today she will present uh, the latest flagship report on the region with the title, A New State of Mind, Greater Transparency and Accountability in Middle East and North Africa. And without further ado, Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Cordella, for the kind invitation and for also the kind introduction. It's a fantastic pleasure for me to be here with you today. And um, I would like to use this presentation of a product that my office uh, publishes twice a year as an opportunity to have a conversation with you, the future leaders in policy, uh, and I hope also development, about what you find interesting, uh, questions that you might have about the Middle East and North Africa, and why not also about the World Bank. Just for me to know, how many of you are from the Middle East and North Africa or are studying uh, the Middle East and North Africa as a specialization? Oh, okay, so there's a good group, excellent. So I look forward to your questions. Now, um, this is, I'm here presenting, but this is a product of my office and this uh, particular report, which we call uh, in the typical alphabet soup of the World Bank MEU, is the MENA Economic Update, and MENA stands for Middle East and North Africa, which for the World Bank goes from Morocco all the way to Lebanon, including Djibouti, but excluding countries that have affinity with the Middle East and North Africa in a sort of historical and cultural way, such as, for example, Turkey. Um, so this is a particularly hefty tome, which we put together uh, with two parts. The first one, which is the typical one that we issue twice a year in spring and in October, and this is the issue of October 2022, has an initial part of a macro outlook. So I will start with just uh, a few uh, uh, views on what's going on in the region right now from the macroeconomic perspective. And part two is instead a collective volume of es essays that looks at uh, transparency and accountability in the region. For those of you who are studying the Middle East and North Africa, um, I hope that this theme sort of clicks as one of the key areas where this beautiful region could really make um, a dramatic progress. But um, let me see if I click. Okay. Okay, perfect. So um, let me just start with some key messages so that you have a sense of where I might be going. The part of the outlook for the region, which is being updated as we speak, because we're going to issue a new report in April, is still kind of valid and gives a, uh, a sort of overview of what's happening in 2022. As you, I'm sure you all know, we moved globally from an environment of low interest rates and low inflation to one where, you know, low went to high. And even if inflation seems to be taming right now, it went to uh, um, one digit uh, in Europe and in the US, but double digit in a number of countries uh, in the past year. Uh, 
the MENA region, and that's kind of like the sum of the three key topics that I'll, I will address very briefly, is one that had uh, increasing inflation, a two-track growth trajectory for 2022, and high debt, which is a result not only of the lingering effect of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, but also of past vulnerability. Something that I'll try to sort of touch upon, but very briefly, is that um, although inflation is now higher than before in the Middle East and North Africa, it's lower than we would expect it to be. And I'll tell you why and how this is connected to some of the topics of transparency and accountability that I'll talk later in part two. And the second point, the one that is probably most dramatic for the region is that oil importing countries in the region are facing significant vulnerabilities because of high debt accumulation. So that's uh, a quick overview of the macro story. Now, part two of the report is one where that speaks to the new state of mind title, which is kind of probably unusual, but um, we hope that it would summarize what we feel could be a path of high payoff reforms in the region. The ones of embracing a new state of mind of more transparency, more accountability, and a bureaucracy that learns uh, along the way. Uh, kind of like, let's say, that says crossing the river while feeding the stones. And again, I hope that this type of um, summary sentence will be clear as we go along in the presentation. But uh, the part two will really be about how to think about the region uh, as it is now, and as it is now as the product of years of, you know, development models that played out uh, over the decades, and what uh, looking through, looking at it through the lens of accountability. But let's start with the macro and what is going on right now. So here is what we do in the report, and again, uh, a bit more expanded summary of the situation. So. We said we went from low interest rates and inflation to high interest rates and inflation. What does it mean? It means that um, the inflation that we see increasing prices in some countries is that is weighing significantly on everybody's budget is to some extent the result of the increase in oil prices. In a country, in, in a region that is for half of its country an oil exporter, there's actually a boom. And this is what uh, underlays the uh, divergent path in growth in the region. So what we saw in the past year is that uh, GCC countries, which are Gulf Cooperation Council countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, the United Arab Emirates, had uh, growth rates uh, anywhere between like six and 8% of GDP in one year. That's a lot. Uh, and instead, the oil uh, importing countries are not only oil importers, but they also food importers. And these two dimensions of inflation, of global inflation, which is uh, food and fuel, uh, is something that is really played out in the region. We'll then say why we say why inflation, although it's higher than before, is unexpectedly low. And then we'll talk about the debt. So let's start with what's going on in the global economy. As I'm sure you know and you have seen, there's much more volatility in commodity prices, and we're really talking oil uh, and gas. And anyone who has paid uh, electricity and and uh, heating bills really knows what uh, I'm talking about here. Another dimension of these commodity prices is that also food prices have gone up. And this is something that happened particularly uh, as a consequence of the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine because of the disruption in the export uh, of uh, a variety uh, of cereals. And these were um, Ukraine and Russia were also the prime exporters of cereals to the MENA region. So these disruptions were particularly significant initially, but also the region has suffered from the overall global increase uh, in uh, cereal price. So here is how this played out uh, in the sort of two uh, sort of big groups of advanced countries. Well, one is just one country, the United States, and the other one is the Euro area. So if you look at the top of this graph, what you see is that the inflation in the United States went up and was particularly core inflation. So everything that is not food and fuel. Inflation also increased. And here we stop in November 2022, because this is kind of like when we were uh, producing the report. 
um, in Europe, the component that really pushed the prices up was energy. And this is what, what I was talking about when we were talking about the bill. So this is the global environment of increasing inflation. Now, as we know that in the past month, it's kind of sort of tapering out, uh, fortunately. But to counteract this increase in inflation, what did central banks do? Suggestions. They jacked up interest rates. And so what you see here at the bottom, let me see if I have a pointer. I don't know, well, here. At the bottom, you see the share of countries that from January 2020, so just before the world was hit uh, by the global pandemic to July 2022, this is the share of countries that were easing monetary conditions, and you see them in blue, and then progressively, you see the, the number of central banks that uh, jacked up interest rates. And then you see here what happens also to interest rates in emerging economies. Parentheses, uh, when the central, when the Fed increases interest rates in the US, uh, if you have a peg to the dollar, like if your exchange rate is kind of fixed to the dollar, what do you need to do to maintain that exchange rate uh, set? Suggestions. When the Fed increases the interest rates, what happens to, what do central banks that have their currencies pegged to the dollar. Peg them means that they are like, they have a fixed exchange rate with the dollar. What do they need to do to avoid like a, fly, a capital flight? They need to do the same because essentially when you're pegged to another currency, let's say the dollar, the Fed kind of, I wouldn't say dictates, but determines your monetary policy. A peg takes away that, uh, instrument of monetary policy, which is the devaluation. Now, if you have a flexible exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the dollar and uh, the Fed jacks up the interest rates, what do you need to do? Or what do you think would happen? I'm thinking about a country like Egypt. And that was a country that had a kind of dirty peg uh, with the dollar. I see Correct. So first, you need to increase interest rates if you want to avoid a, a flight of capital. Sometimes those increases are not enough. And so what we saw in Egypt was exactly what you were saying, some increases of the interest rate to try to uh, stave off a, a flight of capitals. Uh, we saw the central bank be, being very active with, you know, uh, depleting its uh, our currency reserves to buy um, uh, Egyptian pounds against dollars to prop it up. And in the end, we saw quite a bit of a devaluation. The quite a bit is quite a lot, actually, because if uh, looked on the two year period between the beginning of 2020 and where we are now, it's almost 80% of the value of the Egyptian pound. So a lot was going on that was uh, in part due to the sort of exogenous shocks, the pandemic, the uh, Ukraine invasion by Russia, but also uh, the sort of monetary policy tightening that uh, had to happen in the United States. And inflation, and I'll, I'll leave it there for... Uh, I'll show you later, and I have a whole story about it, so... Stay tuned, <laughs> stay tuned, but it's double digit. I can just tell you something. I don't want to spoil the whole story. Okay. It's double digit, <laughs> it's double digit. And, um, you know, it's kind of, for somebody like myself and Professor Cordella, who has worked, Tito, has worked at the World Bank where, um, you know, the, the priority lens through which we look at uh, development is really, the impact on the poor. To think about inflation in double digit, it's painful. Because as I'm sure you know, uh, the most vulnerable, like the lowest quintile in the income distribution are the ones whose expenditure is uh, percentage-wise highest in food and fuel. And they're the ones who suffer the most when inflation happens. So it's, you know, it, it feels kind of gimmicky here that we're going like it goes up, it goes down, but 
there is a pain that is felt dramatically by the most vulnerable. But um, so we were talking about what was happening in the world. And here is just a sort of snapshot of how the forecast of growth, so how, and this is from focused uh, uh, economics, which is a sort of consensus of different uh, economists and experts in the region, how the growth forecast for different groups of countries in the region evolved, starting from February 2022, which is uh, when Russia started the, uh, the war in Ukraine. So look at on the left hand side panel, you see 2022. On the right hand side panel, you see the forecast for 2023. Now, for 2022, okay, it's behind us. But I, what I wanted to show you was um, how the forecast, is, the forecast of growth has changed from vis a vis 2022 as the year progressed. And you see four colors here yellow is developing oil importers. And let me just, just say who these countries are, because for us it's a sort of common grouping in the MENA region. But actually, let me ask you, who do you think the developing oil importers might be in the Middle East and North Africa? Which countries? Let's start from the, develop, from the GCC countries. I think I said which ones were those. Uh, Gulf Cooperation Council. Let's. Nope. Bahrain. Just a couple more. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, and United Arab Emirates. So those are usually grouped together because they are all oil exporters. So they really share that feature that is dominant in their economy, and they're all high income countries. So they're all rich. Then there are the developing oil exporters. So these are sort of middle income countries that export oil in the middle, middle East and North Africa. Which ones could this be? Is three. Mm -mm. Egypt exports gas. Okay. Good point. <laughs> and you kind of put your finger on something that I need to come clean about. We don't have forecast for Libya in here. Um, so good point. It would be in there if we had the numbers. There's other three, please. Iran, correct. Two more. One more. You catch me in another, uh, for another country that would be in that group if we had the data. But no data, we don't have any data in terms of what is happening uh, to the GDP uh, in Syria. So that's a very good point, but it's not in this group. There is one, one more country, which is middle income, is an oil exporter, and had recently a very important deal with Italy in terms of gas the neighbor, not Tunisia, Algeria. Although you are on the right track in the sense that also Tunisia will be connected to Italy with uh, a gas duct to be able to sort of, you know, diversify the, the sources of gas. Anyway, so we did a little bit of geography and you caught me on a couple of uh, weak points, which is uh, there's a lot of fragility in the Middle East and North Africa. And this is not only Libya, it's not only Syria, but it's also and especially Yemen. And for these countries, it's very difficult to have data, to have sensible predictions on uh, where the income per capita is and where growth is. So uh, long story short, now that we know who is who, the, ah, no, oh, oh, developing oil imported, just two countries. One was mentioned before as potentially being in the GCC group, Jordan. So Jordan is a developing oil importing country. Another one is the one connected to Italy for future gas duct, Tunisia and Lebanon, which is however not included here because it has some um, forecasts that are off the chart, uh, but, um, but Egypt. So Egypt is a developing oil importing country that has been growing quite robustly but it, at the moment is, of, is undergoing a, 
uh, a currency crisis and potentially more. So what you see here, just to give you a sense of this, what, what I mean by two-track growth, uh, you see that how the forecasts of growth uh, in developing oil importers evolved over the years since the invasion of Ukraine. They became worse and worse. You see that yellow line just going down. You see also that as oil prices went up, uh, the forecast of, for GCC countries and to some extent for the developing oil exporters went up and up, particularly for the GCC countries. Just one number for all, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia grew by 8.6% or 8.8% last year. Uh, and you see the sort of average for the region, which is in blue, kind of like teetering in the middle. So it was uh, overall a growth last year of 5.5% for the region, which was vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the developing world quite robust, but really uh, sort of hides this bifurcation that oil exporters grew very fast because oil prices were very high and oil importers saw their situation progressively worsen. And so, and let me conclude here on the story of growth. What we see in panel B is that the forecasts for 2023 are not disastrous, but they are changing for the worse as of 2022. And at the moment, the global economic prospects, which is the bi-yearly um, publication of the World Bank with uh, the world forecast, sets uh, the growth of the MENA region at about 3.5%, so two percentage points below last year and with significant concerns about uh, oil importers. So here is, well, I'll, I'll go on to that, uh, let's go over that and move on from growth to inflation. So here is something that can answer Tito's question. So what was inflation in Egypt? Let me say a couple of things about this graph. So first of all, this is inflation from March, 2022 to November 2022 on a year-on-year -year basis. Look first at um, the orange bars. So that the orange bars are measured inflation in a country. So just to give an answer, in that period, the year-on-year -year inflation in Egypt was about 15%. And you measure uh, the inflation on the left-hand side um, axis for most countries, except for Iran and Lebanon, which is measured on the right-hand side, because inflation in these two countries was off the charts. And particularly in Lebanon, it was not only driven by the fact that the country is, uh, exporter, is an importer of almost everything, but by a dramatic devaluation of the Lebanese pound. Lebanon is currently in a debt uh, crisis and stalemate, and also in a banking uh, crisis. So in, in a very complex situation, and a large uh, part of the population has actually gone from being middle class to being what we would consider poor and vulnerable. So it's really a dramatic situation. Now, what you see here are also some gray bars. And this is something that uh, we've done a calculation that um, we've done in my office and my colleague called us and uh, run the numbers. And it is how high inflation would have been if these countries had not adopted a variety of product market intervention. So let me tell you what I mean by product market intervention. Whoops. Okay. So we took a kind of, we looked at the uh, press uh, in the six months before November, 2022, and we took account of whether a country was uh, imposing policies such as increasing food and fuel subsidies, instituting price control, uh, imposing trade regulations that would decrease the price of certain goods, uh, imposing, well, elim using tax exemptions, imposing product-specific exchange rates or other uh, regulation vis-a-vis -vis prices. As you see, and this is the sort of left-hand side of that graph, this table is quite populated by checks. So, these countries, and in particular the development oil importers, did a lot of stuff to try to control prices. Now, um, let's go back to the sort of econ, macroecon 101 on how global prices, which we kind of identify as the increasing price of gas and the increase, 
food, you know, uh, oil and gas and increasing uh, food prices transfer into local prices. That is what is called the pass-through. This pass-through uh, is not 100% for a variety of reasons. Not all the goods that you consume are traded, are imported, some are sort of non-tradable, haircut, for example. Um, the pass-through can be very high or not very high, depending on whether a country is going it through a devaluation. And so you might expect that the pass-through was very high in a country like Egypt that devaluated a lot. And then the pass-through is also uh, staked off if a country imposes things like price controls, subsidies to reduce the price of the consumer and stuff like that. All of those things that I put in that table. So how does this whole story that I'm trying to tell you about inflation in the Middle East and North Africa come together? Okay, let's go back to that graph. I'd ask you to focus first on the orange bars. That's the actual inflation that was measured. What we've done is that we constructed a measure of counterfactual inflation, and that's the gray bar. So that is how high inflation would have been uh, without all those policies where you saw the checks, subsidies, price controls, uh, exchange rate specific, um, product specific exchange rates, and so on. So what you see is that mostly, uh, those interventions have lowered the inflation rate. Let's focus on Egypt. So without all those interventions, inflation rate in Egypt would have been 23% in that period. But instead, it was only 15%. So that's one thing. The other thing that I wanted to um, also highlight, but this is for maybe a separate conversation when you have like a uh, more sort of deep dive on international macro, you probably notice that for some countries, inflation was quite high, and for a bunch of other countries, inflation was quite low. And the main divide for high inflation and low inflation has been on whether countries have a peg with the US, like uh, the Gulf countries, and I see a smile in... Oh, well, uh, you should have said I, I would have skipped the, those slides. Okay. Perfect. So kind of, you see here in practice, you see the pass-through story here in practice. And also you see, please. It de so it depends on, uh, so for what concerns this product market intervention, it depends whether the product market interventions were specific to food and fuel or not. So here, I would say that the majority of those interventions were on food and fuel. And for those of you who know the MENA region uh, a bit, you would know that there is a tradition of, for example, universal subsidies in food and fuel. A country like uh, Tunisia has uh, subsidies to um, keep relatively low the price of, I think, cooking oil and flour. Baladi bread is subsidized in Egypt. And the GCC countries all had some form of uh, reduction of uh, the price of oil. In a way, there is a sense in the social contract that this is our resource, why should we pay a lot for something that is our resource? This is a conversation that would deserve, I think, like a whole, um, uh, you know, discussion on, onto itself. But it was a very good question because it leads us, and I hope you'll, you'll hang on to that thought, to the fact that these countries tend to be very proactive in product market intervention. Um, and not every country is doing that. Some countries in the world, you know, they kept the price low of some goods to avoid people going to the streets. But there is an alternative to uh, having product market intervention and yet protect the ones who are most vulnerable to price increases, which are the poor. And the alternative is something that we explore, sorry, we explore first here 
and this is targeted social protection interventions, cash transfers, uh, support for paying the bills, or you know, improved targeting of cash transfers. And we see that you know, together with these product market interventions, countries in the Middle East and North Africa also uh, pumped up cash transfers. So I would say that's a very good thing. Although they really, they, I would say countries have thrown the whole arsenal of uh, policy instruments to combat inflation. Yikes. Uh, that was about the time, so it was not about that. So I'll try to, to be quicker. Um, so what we have done here, and I, I'm not asking you to sort of, uh, you know, go through the detail of the graphs, but the intuition is that we compared um, the cost of universal subsidies to compensate the universe of the population for a specific shock in, food, in the prices of food and energy vis-a-vis -vis how much it costs to have uh, transfers to cash transfers to the first decile, the second decile of the poors, the third decile of the poors. Lo and behold, the share of the two is this blue line that drops dramatically. So um, the share of the cost of general subsidies over transfers is massively high uh, when what you would want to do is to actually compensate only the poor who are here. I'm not sure that I said it really well, but let me say it in another way so that it comes out better. So if you give targeted cash transfers, you compensate, um, let's say if you can do perfect targeting, you compensate the poorest uh, in the economy. So you end up spending uh, as much as this orange line, which is increasing. Um, but it's pretty low. So if you want to compensate, let's say, half of the economy, you spend something like 0.5% of GDP, which is not very much. But if you want to compensate, if you instead have uh, target, untargeted uh, subsidies, you spend up to 1.2% of GDP just to compensate for that. Um, uh, for that shock. I hope this is kind of an intuition that is clear, but if it's not clear in the mechanics, I hope it's clear in the message, meaning that you can achieve the goal of protecting the most vulnerable from uh, price shocks by using targeted cash transfers, which are much, much cheaper than universal subsidies. And why do we care about things that are fiscally more or less costly because whoops, because the debt in some of the countries in the Middle East and North Africa is very high. So what you see here is public debt, medium public debt by country group. You see on the left, 2019, and on the right, 2021. So public debt went up everywhere in the world. And you see that on the orange dots. They are lower in 2019 and they're higher in 2021. Why? Because countries went on with fiscal programs to try to protect the economy from the pandemic shock. But what you see is that, uh, first of all, middle income oil importers, Jordan, Tunisia, Egypt, that we were talking about, have um, public debt, medium public debt that is significantly higher than their comparator around the world. I'm moving away from the microphone, but this is what I'm talking about. The difference from here and the orange dot. So Tunisia, Jordan, Egypt have public debt, entered the pandemic with public debt that was significantly higher than the typical middle income country around the world, say Mexico. Uh, as we move post pandemic, this debt increase, increased for everyone in the world, but increased in levels that at the median are about 80% for uh, middle income oil importers. Um, without focusing you all on this table, just to give you a sense of how precarious that equilibrium for debt in oil importing countries is, focus on this one number. I'm moving away from the microphone for a second. This is the ratio of interest payments to government revenue in Egypt. 
aging was spending before the increase in interest rate was spending half of its government revenues just to pay interest on the debt. Uh, places like Moody's or other rating agencies would tell you that they kind of look already at 20, the 25 percent ratio of interest to uh, revenues as like a concern. Sri Lanka, which as you know went through that distress, was at 75 percent. Egypt was at 50 percent before interest rates went up. Now, uh, the first part of what I told you was a quick overview of the current quick, maybe not, overview of the current macro. But in summary, what we saw is that 2022 was actually, on average, a good year for the region. But this good year was good, very good for some countries and much less good for others. The ones that gained were the ones that benefited from uh, the increases in oil prices. Inflation was high everywhere in the world, and it was also high in MENA, more so in countries that had a flexible peg than the ones who had a fixed peg. What we saw also is that almost all of these countries at, were very active in product market interventions, uh, fixing prices, giving subsidies. Uh, what we tried to, sh what I tried to sort of uh, instilling you is that although that's a strategy that reduced inflation below what it would have been otherwise, it's a very fiscally costly strategy because you can achieve the most important thing, which is to protect the poor by having targeted cash transfers. Why do we care about doing things cheaply? Because some of these countries, the Jordan, the Tunisia, the Egypt of the world, entered the pandemic already with high debt. And when you have a country like Egypt that spends half of its revenues just to pay that service, you know that the fiscal space is not very much. Now, um, I told Tito, I, 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 I think I got carried, uh, carried away and I prepared the presentation that is too long. One question I'm asking. Yes. Is it okay to get right from the first slide? Sure, yeah, why not? Much better. Yeah, very good idea. And then we can sort of go through some highlights of the second part, and then I'll be happy to okay hang to up. Of course, I'll be happy to hang around for, with whatever questions that you might have later. Perfect. Um, hi, thank you for uh, this presentation. It's been really interesting. Going back to the um, counterfactual inflation numbers, um, I noticed that some of those countries had higher inflation after the um, product market interventions. And I just wanted to know why that sounds, uh, it, it seems not very intuitive, at least to me. So why does the intervention make the inflation um, worse? That's a very good point. Do you prefer me to answer each question as they come? Maybe it's more specific. Yeah. So, so okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So first of all, the catch, and this is true. So I haven't really gone over this table, but this is the sort of uh, average uh, change that this type of interventions have uh, brought about in inflation. And in most cases, all the way from Egypt uh, to uh, Iraq, they actually reduced uh, inflation. But these interventions were so many and they interacted in such different ways that it could be that if you fix the price somewhere, you might end up with a higher price somewhere else. And this is this type of uh, counterintuitive effect has happened in Jordan, Djibouti, and Iran. If I may just interject an intuition here, which speaks to the bigger point of uh, how product market interventions differ, for example, from using cash transfers, is that governments were really trying to keep prices low. That is good if you're suffering from arriving at the end of the month. But as you all know, all of you who have studied economics, you know that there's no free lunch. So that's going to come out somewhere else. The second thing that happens is that once you start 
uh, distorting prices, you distort signals in the economy. So let's say that, you know, uh, this year the price of wheat went up. Suppliers, farmers, they know that now wheat is much more valuable. And so there's a sense in which they might expand the supply of wheat. If you keep the price set somewhere because at some level that is not the market level, you distort all of those incentives. So in some way, you might end up distorting them in the opposite direction of what you would like to do. Thank you, very good question. Other questions? No. I think we go on then. Yeah. We, we, we can go on and you should feel free to, you know, as if questions come along in, in your head, just feel free to stop me anytime. So. Oh, okay. Ah, yeah. Ooh. Hey, from Rafael. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I understand that cash transfer targeting the poor cost less than general subsidies for food, for cooking oil, etc. I'm wondering, however, what the political costs are. Cash transfer targeting the poor may have the impact that, all consider, it is the middle class that is paying the price of rising inflation. But from the other up, up, uprising, we know that the middle class was very active in the demonstration against the regime. For its example in Egypt. Happy to hear your thoughts. So I know Rafaela and I wanted to thank Rafaela for following us online and I look forward to seeing her tomorrow. This is a very difficult question that she is asking. And in a way, we asked ourselves this question because by comparing the fiscal cost uh, of these two strategies, one might come to the conclusion is like, why doesn't everybody just do only cash transfers? And if you look around in the world, it's not only many countries that have imposed some form of price controls. Now, um, something that um, Rafaela hints in her question, she says, uh, you know, there have been uprisings and uh, the middle class was very active in demonstrations against the regime, for example, in Egypt. So there are various parts to trying to unpack this this very good question. The first one is that we know there is an evidence of correlation, if not causation, between increase in uh, prices, inflation, and demo oh, sorry, and demonstration. So um, we can speculate that uh, this the being very active in controlling prices was also a way to avoid really that people would go to the street. But Rafael is right that there have been demonstrations in Egypt and there have been also demonstrations in Jordan. Jordan, for example, had gone through a reform uh, uh, of the subsidy, of fuel subsidies, so they were eliminated, but then they were, uh, they were reintroduced uh, midway into the pandemic and then they were eliminated again in uh, December. And then they faced dramatic demonstrations. So I can't say that, you know, countries should just have cash transfers and so be it. But there is a tradition in the Middle East and North Africa of probably overusing subsidies, in part because uh, going to the street uh, is in many countries the main way for people to express their discontent vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, uh, their political system that uh, makes decisions. So. I am aware that uh, the comparison might be uh, oversimplified, and I think Rafael is right there. But what I want to point at is that continuing to use these uh, product market quasi-fiscal measures will come at a cost some other time in the future. And that fiscal cost can be really dramatic and pile up for countries that have high debt. So in a way, countries are between uh, a, a, Lincudin el Martello, I would say in Italian. Um, and I know that there is a similar um, expression in English, but it sort of escapes me. That's not a hard place. A rock and hard place. So these countries are between a rock and a hard place. Future costs that are going to pile up in the debt or keeping people appeased right now. And we know that politicians tend to be myopic and have a preference for the today. 
but tomorrow might already be coming in a country like Egypt, uh, where the devaluation that we see is probably more of a symptom of the sort of fiscal situation than just a simple currency crisis in and of itself. So thank you, Rafaela, for this very good question. And I look forward to discussing more tomorrow. So um, this part here is something that uh, is probably too long a story for me to go over today, but I wanted to give you some sense of what we were trying to achieve here. And what, let's say, if I can arrive at, uh, have you understand what I mean by the learning state, I would be super happy. Hopefully I will, I will even convince you. So this is a, this is to, just to acknowledge that it, it takes a village, if not a small town, uh, sometimes to produce a report. So I wanted to acknowledge all of my co-authors who uh, worked with me. But the idea that we had in, uh, in our mind is that some of the challenges that we see today, particularly for oil importing countries, um, have roots, not only, oops, the noise of the, I found myself that I was sort of projecting a lot of, very good, that's okay, I can, I can be quiet. Huh? So, let's go. Okay, that's all right, okay, that's okay. So, so what we wanted to uh, convey here is that, convey here, is that the challenges that we see today in the Middle East and North Africa are the result of vulnerabilities that predated the pandemic. For sure, then the pandemic shock and then the invasion of Ukraine piled up on those pre-existing vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities. But if you look at uh, both per capita GDP growth and TFP, total factor productivity growth in uh, my country, uh, in the past 20 years, uh, they are kind of mediocre at best in terms of performance. And they are all either just at the median for their income group, middle income, being middle income or uh, low income or below. So it's sort of like chronic low growth, which for those of you who have followed uh, the, the region, at least since the Arab Spring, had resulted in really disappointing labor markets. And many uh, say that the sort of youth unemployment and the lack of opportunities was really the sort of uh, uh, initially ignition of uh, the Arab Spring. And what you see here, it's just a couple of statistics just to give you a sense of what, what's going on, but it's the share of employment that is informal, which means either without a contract or without social security or both. And in a country like Egypt or Morocco is anywhere between 69% to 77%. And one World Development Report that I think 10 years ago, that we are at the 10 years, used to, used to say informal is normal. And you know, if like three quarters of your employment is informal, that's really the vast majority of what goes on in your country. And this large informality, which is associated with low productivity of jobs, also goes together with people not having jobs and particularly youth. So there's something about the disappointing growth in the past 20 years that also is disappointing from the point of view of opportunities that come through um, the labor market. So you, then you won't be surprised if I say that um, uh, life satisfaction in, in, in this region is below, uh, mostly below, uh, income tiers. And what you see here is just one very basic way to benchmark indicators, which is to plot the log of GDP per capita on the x-axis, to plot the variable on that you, you're looking at on the y-axis. This is like life satisfaction, I think this is from Dallo. And then you sort of draw a regression line and you look at who's above and who's below. And most of the region is actually quite a bit below what you where you would predict it to be vis-a-vis uh, -vis its income. And not only in a cross-section, but also over time. So that's uh, the MENA region on the right-hand side is depicted in blue, and you see the life satisfaction is sort of, uh, sort of goes downward starting from 2006, and uh, 2011 is marked as the year for, um, of the Arab Spring, and sadly things didn't get 
uh, much better after that. Something that um, we also touched upon uh, indirectly here is the fact that also fragility increased. So somebody said, what about Syria? A country that uh, is still involved and is dramatically now also facing the, the consequences of the earthquake, but it has been in a sort of form of war since the Arab Spring. Uh, think about Libya, uh, think about Yemen, which has uh, almost up to half of the population, which is food insecure. So there is something that is just not quite right uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. And so um, my predecessor, his name is Rabaret, he is a macroeconomist, has started like a large program of reports on different sectors like water, land, jobs, migration, digital economy, and all of that. And he left and I came in and I was supervising all of these reports, these books that have been launched in the past two years. And each of them was pointing at one key solution to sort of make things better, be it from the perspective of land uh, or from the perspective of access to water, and it was to improve governance. And so I started looking into the question of governance, and I'll be quick here, but I really feel that my region has a governance deficit. And these are different indicators, but look on the right hand side, same methodology as before, how to benchmark a country, plot log of GDP per capita, plot that variable, and here is like a measure of accountability on the y-axis and see who's above, who's below the fitted line. So it's a kind of, you know, um, very basic way. The MENA region is all in, the MENA country regions are all in red. Uh, there's almost none on the predicted line on the fitted line. They're all below where you would expect, expect them to be given their GDP. Uh, so this is story of accountability, which is sort of like, if you're deputed to do something and you don't do it, there are consequences for you to not do it. Please, the question. This is uh, West Bank and, and Gaza. Uh, the one here uh, to the left, and this is Lebanon. So uh, just to give you a sense of why you would see those patterns, this is a very interesting measure, and it's a new one. It's not the World Governance Indicators, which is the one on the left, which is produced by the World Bank, but this is a new measure of accountability uh, that has been published, I think, two years ago on the American Journal of Political Science. And it looks at three dimensions of accountability, uh, vertical between uh, the elected and the electorate, horizontal across different institutions of the state, and diagonal, which is between the executive and the media. So it's a specific measure of accountability. And you would find that, you know, Lebanon is a country with a lot of problems, um, but it's a country where um, everybody says, uh, you know, it's quite, uh, a, quite a clear arena of political debate in terms of uh, elections and in terms of uh, uh, media activity. I thought there was another question. No, okay. So two dimensions, accountability, we're not doing so well, and transparency. There are many dimensions of transparency. The one that I focus on, and maybe just because of the job that I have, is access to data. So what we've done here, we pretended to be the sort of anonymous visitor of a website of a NSO, a National Statistical Office. For Italy, it would be ISTAT. Um, and every country has a national statistical office. And we looked at uh, four or five dimensions where you would expect a country to have data and make them available. And then we use a traffic light, sort of green, yellow, and red for whether those data were not available. They, they're just not collected, that's the red. They're collected by not available, and that's the orange. They are, and they are collected and they are available. So. If we take this as a proxy for the transparency that we see in the region, I don't think that we do so well. There's too much red here. And the one country um, that 
uh, has collects the data and makes them all available. Yeah, like you write an email, literally, and they send you the micro data of a labor force survey within two days, is the one in West Bank and Gaza, the Palestinian territories. Maybe we're banking for World Bank. I that could be uh, that could be one angle. Uh, I I have a sense that um, there's more political economy behind this behavior uh, than just how many of us provide technical Maybe assistance. Provide budget support to provide technical assistance. That could be one, but there's also um, you know. Uh, my colleague Hans Hogevin, who wrote the piece from which this data uh, are taken, has interesting um, hypotheses for why we might see this pattern. But there's a sense in which uh, governments continue to control the access to information um, in ways that really are not aligned with the capacity of these national statistical offices. Some of these national statistical offices are really impressive and they have technicians who are top notch yet if you send a letter to access micro data to do a labor market study it takes months and visits and i'm still not there so i'm conveying a personal experience please a question So I think that this is a um, an excellent question, and I think you gave the two uh, concurrent answers for why we think that this matters. So uh, some studies have identified a direct causal link between data openness and growth. Some other studies have shown that countries that have more data openness have uh, lower spread on their sovereign debt. Uh, other studies, and one of which um, was produced in, in my office, uh, looked at um, the relationship between data openness and the data ecosystem and the um, how precise growth forecasts are. And what we find is that the worse the data ecosystem, the more optimistic uh, forecasts are. Uh, and so if forecasts are too optimistic, you might, you as a, the government or the Minister of Finance might be too profligate, for example, in your spending. And then you go like, oops. So this is something that has an indirect impact on how you manage the economy, how you're able to do uh, counter cyclical policy and so on. At the same time, these are probably a proxy and a reflection of a process that has not completely unfolded of trusting uh, think tanks and researchers and the civil society to use this data in a productive way. And just to sort of maybe conclude and sort of skip all the sectoral analysis that we did, the idea is really that um, if countries release data, if uh, think tanks, policymakers, academics use this data to measure what is happening, that's really the way to crossing the river while filling, the, while filling the stones. And something that brings this conversation back to what we saw in the macro part is that we have so much uncertainty now that even the sort of well-tested solutions to development, we're not even sure that they fully work now. So at the same time, while the government and the bureaucracy is called to do many things, fiscal policy, cash transfers, um, support people through these shocks, it's important that they do it while learning what works and what doesn't. But if you don't have access to data, if you don't have that sort of exchange of ideas that can come from this type of 
uh, analysis. And if you don't have the accountability to take action and course correct as you go along, you are likely to uh, be led astray and then find yourself five years into it and go like, what? What happened? So to sit on the positive, what we say in this report, and let me conclude here so that maybe we can have more of a conversation rather than a presentation, is that some of these countries, the oil importing ones, are really on the brink of something that might go wrong because their debt stocks are very high and because the global conditions have changed. Reforming towards more transparency and more accountability is something that just takes political will, but not money necessarily. And so it's a very fiscally cheap reform that however can really inform how to do things better as country go towards a recovery for sustainable growth. And so this is particularly important for oil importing countries because the fiscal space for them is like super restricted, but it's also important for the countries that are doing really well now because something that I, I don't think I showed, but if any of you had looked at the long-term graphs or predictions of oil prices, what do you think is gonna happen by 2050 to oil prices? Are they gonna be above what they are now or below? And why? Okay, so let me see. Okay, raise your hand if you think the pri oil prices in 2050 are gonna be above what they are today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Raise your hand if you think the um, oil prices are gonna be below. One, two, three. Is that the same? You did you raise your hand for both? I <laughs> know. <laughs> so the same. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So this is. And are there? Who are the undecided? Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Um, my take on this is always good not to make predictions as an economist because <laughs> the chance of being wrong is always high. Yeah, I'm thinking, exactly, uh, particularly in a question like this one. I'm thinking about Irving Fisher, who went on record in 1927 saying the economy is very healthy. And then there was this crack. Was 27 or 33? 33, sorry, 33. Okay. So the prediction on oil prices by the International Agency for Energy is that oil prices are gonna slow. So is that the predictions have increased as the situation in Ukraine has worsened because of the disruption in the export of oil. But overall, there is a downward slope in the prediction of prices for 2050 because hopefully, will we'll all be at net zero emissions. Don't laugh. So, please. Oh, that was very good. <laughs> Inshallah. As I would say, in my region, people would say. But so, if prices go to 22, let's say 70, which is the sort of value that is predicted by, I think, 2050, um, what's going to happen to countries that are now uh, benefiting tremendously from uh, oil exports and where oil exports are like 50% of their exports? They're not going to be as well off as they are now. So for them, it's a good moment to experiment about what works and what doesn't to sort of move the economy from being so concentrated on uh, hydrocarbons to having a broader base growth, be it on you know high tech tourism or whatever they want to diversify in. So it's a good moment for to learn, experiment, and learn from evidence. So to conclude, and this is just to show you that I had a lot of slides, so I can I'm happy to speak to any of them. Um, so. These, cri these crises have, sh have sort of really shown the, the, the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, the increasing prices, the increasing interest rates have really shown the fault lines uh, in uh, the MENA region. And some countries have arrived at the pandemic uh, really with significant vulnerabilities uh, already. There are some reforms out there 
that are cheap and have great payoffs. And those reforms are reforms that increase the transparency and accountability uh, of how the bureaucracy and the government operate. We saw two examples of transparency and accountability for transparency was data openness. And we discussed how these are both the symptoms of a sort of process that is not there yet of full trust between uh, government and uh, society, but it can also even have high direct benefits in terms of growth, lower uh, bond yields that the market uh, requires, and better understanding of the evidence and better planning. So what we are trying to push is a conversation about transparency and accountability in the region in a moment when, you know, it was it Winston Churchill or um, who said, don't let a crisis go to waste? I think it was also Ram Emanuel. Both of them uh, in, said something like, it's not a quip. It's a moment in which things can change. And why not use this moment, this crisis to make, to change them for the better? So that's what I want to leave you with a sort of uplifting message of what could happen and happy to discuss. So thank you. Any questions? Let me start with okay. I see also one there. Uh, can I go back to your point about changing the sort of nature of the market so it's not just focused on commodities trying to diversify into tourism or something like that right how do these countries that have such high debt already or such high interest payments to gdp ratio navigate a situation that's difficult like this to get more investments or capital or finance public debt to make these infrastructure projects viable so um okay so the countries that need to diversify the most are the countries that are uh, most concentrated now in hydrocarbons. And you know we have that imperative, not only because diversification exposes you less to vulnerability in you know, oil prices. Like if you look at the growth rates of countries that are high, rich in resources, it, it sort of goes up and down. And so it's a costly way to grow. Those countries are actually doing relatively well right now, but they are the ones who need to diversify the most. And so uh, in the Gulf, they're doing different things. Uh, they have a lot of different industrial policies, subsidies, training, uh, new initiatives. And for example, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and I just came from Riyadh last night, uh, has, uh, is really pushing this, the tourism sector and is really capitalizing on how important it is uh, as a draw uh, for um, devotion in, in Islam and uh, in the Islamic world, and also the beautiful sort of ruins that it has uh, close to Riyadh and so on. So uh, those countries that have money, they are using industrial policy and they are trying to put the money towards developing the non-resource sector. The countries that are more vulnerable right now are the oil importers. And they don't suffer necessarily from a problem of excessive concentration in hydrocarbon, but they suffer from a different problem. Think about Egypt, something that I had in one of the slides. Um, let me see if I can put it up quickly. If not, I'll just tell you the story. Da, 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 da. Okay, this one. I don't know if it really tells the story, but let me just tell you the exercise that we did here. And there's a slide so you can trust it. I'm talking about something that exists, but I, I'm not asking you to interpret that slide necessarily. So what we have done, and by we, I mean my colleagues, um, Asif Islam and Federica Saliola, um, looked into uh, comparing the Middle East and North Africa vis-a-vis -vis, uh, developed countries under one dimension, the number of sectors in which there are state-owned enterprises. State-owned enterprises in a country like Egypt, not only are state-owned, but they also have very advantageous conditions to operate. They have cheaper credit. Uh, at times they are protected in terms of have uh, protected from uh, competition. They might be kept alive even if they are not productive uh, or profitable uh, for years in a row. So, Looking at in how many sectors there are SOEs, we found that uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, on average, there are SOEs in 
tons of sectors where you would not see a rationale for the government to intervene. So there's not a clear externality, there's not a clear market failure. Food and services, tourism, there are SOEs uh, in a number of sectors. What, it, what this does is that it sort of stifles private sector growth. And so to kind of short circuit the answer to your questions, like what could these countries do that are vulnerable now because of high debt and because of changing conditions? The best thing that they can do is to grow, but not to grow like Egypt has done in the past years, which was to grow through uh, large infrastructure projects, which were financed by debt to grow because of a dynamic private sector. And there are lots of distortion in the market that make it difficult for a private sector to grow. And so I started from uh, SOEs, state-owned enterprises, but if you look at the private sector, what happens in the Middle East and North Africa is that uh, firms tend to be older than uh, firms in the rest of the world or in comparator countries. So there's not enough of that creative destruction. When firms enter, they don't grow. They kind of stay stuck in the size that they have at the beginning. And they tend to start smaller than the average size of a firm like it would start in Brazil, let's say. So making removing the, the distortions that stifle now the growth of the uh, private sector, I think, would be my first order answer to your very question. I see another one here. No? Ah, oh, sorry, I thought that was a question. You had a provocative question. I had a provocative question. All right. I thought it was very nice, and I agree very much with your analysis. Okay. But this idea of governments, accountability, transparency yeah. is something we already heard from 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Uh, some people took it seriously. It was the Arab Spring. Yeah. It touched vested interest, and we ended up in a recession yeah. and the reconsolidation of the state. So why should this time work? I, so Tito, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer. And I don't want to answer because I'm an optimist. So what we asked ourselves that question. The Arab Spring was a sort of popular movement that tried to subvert a status quo that had not delivered all of those things. And I try also to show you in the data that make, uh, that sort of can guarantee a shared prosperity, jobs, uh, you know, opportunities and so on, a fair, a level playing field. Um, I'm not calling, so let me go on record. I'm not calling for a new Arab Spring. You can also switch off the, the, the can I? So you can Let me go on record. I'm not calling for. <laughs> the World Bank for, for, for a popular. For, for, no, that's okay. For a, for a, um, for that type of movement, also because it didn't work. So we actually saw that things got worse, not better, uh, from the Arab Spring. Um, our hope were at least twofold. The first one is that by talking about it and by sort of engaging intellects and mind, there would be a stronger awareness of where the problem might be. And this is where we took the choice of not just going with the list. You know, sometimes the World Bank and the fund do, okay, you need to do this to, you know, okay, current account deficits, you need to do this. Then you need to have this much sort of less spending. So instead of taking the approach of saying a list of what you need to do, we try to approach it from the how you need to do it. By, the, by thinking that we have really intelligent counterparts and they know what's the technical solution to an economic problem. And here we try to unearth that there are different ways of going about it that have to do with transparency and accountability. So why now? I felt that, you know, crises are opportunities for governments to actually make a change. And governments are not just one person. Sometimes they are, but they're not all one person. So there might be different forces that pull one way or the other in a government. And this could be one way for the forces that want to move forward with a broader based uh, model of growth, a sort of a fair playing field. And that would be a moment for them to find, uh, you know, to move to the better equilibrium. We also asked ourselves, 
we even put it there. That's why I put that slide because it's like, okay, so if good governance is so good, you know, all the benefits that I was trying to list. So why isn't it happening? And so I think that Peter was uh, hinting at, you know, that there are, ben there are people, their groups, elites, or beneficiaries from the status quo, and they are the groups that one would need to compensate somehow and convince that there is an equilibrium out there that is better for everybody. Stefan Derkon, who just came out a couple of months ago with gambling for development, uh, sort of looks at the development process as a bet. And he says that the countries that managed to grow are the ones where the elite made a bet that moving away from a status quo that benefited them to a different status, to a different equilibrium would actually benefit them more. And that's how, how everybody grew. Um, I think the opportunities come from uh, where the status quo is not entrenched in benefits, but sort of kind of, I wouldn't say marginal groups, but for example, um, youth is, out, is not benefiting from what is happening now from uh, the region, informal workers, uh, women tend to be out of the labor force. So uh, maybe reforms have better chances in new sectors where there are not incumbents that are that entrenched and where the ones who are outsiders are the most likely to benefit the most. So while I can't give you like a short answer, maybe these are some paths and some countries will actually uh, take it on. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, given the emphasis on transparency and accountability, I was really interested in the, the strategy of data collection on transparency and looking at the statistical institutes. Um, and I'm interested in perhaps kind of the disparity between transparency and accuracy. So I know Turkey isn't one of the countries that is included in here, but they regularly fire officials from their statistical institute because they're reporting what they think are accurate inflation numbers and the government's not happy about that. And that means that others are incentivized to not accurately report those numbers. So how much is sort of accuracy and political incentives to manipulate the information built into your assessment of that? Thank you. So that's a great question because it points at something that is happening in the uh, news information and data space going from like fake news all the way to uh, firing uh, officials because they report um, data that the, a government might not uh, like. So uh, rather than giving you examples, let me just tell you something that I noticed as I discussed the incentives of not only statistical offices, but also of politicians. This is like, an, I think it's like a, a slant on the story that more accountability is always better. So um, some governments uh, adopt KPI, which are performance indicators for their ministers. So this is something that is a potentially a strong form of accountability, let's say from a ruler or from uh, a government to its ministries, ministers. But then if you have those ministers in the sort of uh, advisory board of the National Statistical Office, uh, they might get fired if the unemployment rate goes up. And so exactly that incentive that you are talking about might play out. And I can't, ex I can't pinpoint that that's exactly what happens for why data are not made available, but it's possible that that's what, what happens. So, um, in that sense, something that uh, I'm, when I go in and give talks in my region, I say, and I see some eyes are going like, what is this lady telling me? I say that I think it's important for a region like mine to normalize failure, meaning it happens that, you know, unemployment goes up, even if you have the best minister of labor in the whole universe, because there's a shock. It might happen that, you know, prices go up because you know, whatever. So in that sense, um, there are different worlds where very strong accountability might result in an incentive to either manipulate data or just not release them altogether, just because the accountability, accountability is taken to its extreme. And I think it's Charles good. I keep on asking you, like, who said that? I, 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 I will judge if you deal with me. You know? 
a good idea. I think it's Charles Goodard who said, well, you know, these days everything is recorded. It's like one remembers yeah. the idea, but not necessarily the detail. So the detail I remember, which might be correct or not, is that Charles Goodhart, who is a um, macroeconomist, okay, um, English, British macroeconomist, he said, a measure stops being a good measure when it becomes an indicator. And so that's the story that you're telling, and it's possible that it happens. So in that sense, accountability matters because you want somebody to take action if something is not working out, but you need also an ecosystem that allows the understanding that maybe the action has been taken, but if you measure the result, it might not be exactly what you want, and you might not need to fire that person because there was a shock. And so that's the sense of really trying to uh, normalize the fact that development is not a linear process. It's a complicated process that has a lot of, has a winding road. And measuring and being honest about it is something that improves things, doesn't make them worse. So that's how, you know, that's what we hope. Look, I think on this note, Given the time constraint, it's probably time to thank Roberto. We'll be around if you have questions. You can, happy. You're happy to go down, we have lunch downstairs. So, Roberta, thank you so much. This was really the perfect kind of talk for studies, not only because you even uh, hinted at some of what we do in more economic theory work and people apply it, but also for the very broad overviews that uh, a region that is close to the size Europe uh, is going through. So we really hope maybe to count on you every year when you do your, when you come to go to the region to present your new report to stop by in Bologna, it would be great to have you again. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.